Welcome to our June 4th gathering of Recite. Um, we do this every month here at the Norman Williams Library, and all sorts of people come and present here, and some people come just to listen, and people who present present their own work, they present the works of others. It's all over the map, and it's fun, and um, all sorts of poems all over the map, too. It's really kind of neat. And thank you, Macy, with WCTV8 for filming this, as always. And then Macy puts it up on his website, and so you're able to see previous editions. And if someone isn't here who should have been, you can say, hey, go to WCTV8.com and look at that thing, and next time, come. Um, and we've taken your name in vain. <laughs> right? Like, where's Hal? <laughs> hey, Hal, we want you to come. Um, it's totally voluntary, so we won't coerce people to come. But, you know, when people come and then don't for a while, we miss them. Um, it is a fun thing. So tonight we have eight of us, I think, who are presenting. Um, and it, it's... Did you I did. I just put you on the list. Okay. But I don't know if you're Jen, Jenny, or Jennifer. Jennifer? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so I have a three little poems to do, and um, you know, this is a. Autumn is great. Spring is wonderful, but interesting. Um, Actually, I don't have my glasses. I'm going to need to get them, so I'll read my poems later. Because <laughs> they're all a blur right now. Um, so I feel like there's things I should have said. I'm sorry I'm rambling. I know something I was going to say. Um, so Recite has been going for over three years, and it's been a wonderful thing. It was started by Josh Dembinski and um, Jeff Levison. And, um, and Sam Di Natale. And Sam Di Natale, back when it was at Montvert. Yeah. And it grew into this thing that has been going strong for over three years. Um, and it used to be that Jeff Levison was in charge of all of the website stuff and sending out the emails that we all don't get anymore because Jeff now lives in China. And so he's kind of out of the loop. So if there's anyone who is interested in doing some of the work of sending out email reminders and or working on the website and things like that. Um, come and talk to me and you know we can talk about that. But um, I don't really have time to do it in my life and Yash doesn't have time to do it. And so far we don't well, have- Well, I, I have time, I don't have the capacity because I'm involved in some other email okay. group on a weekly basis. Okay, all right. Um, so if there is anyone who would like to dive in and do little bits of the stuff that we do behind the scenes to make this happen, let me know. And as always, if anyone would like to host, so it's someone other than me standing up here, let me know, because that's good too. Oh, you do an excellent job. Well, we <laughs> Some days better than others. <laughs> that's great. But if anyone else wants to be up here and get the love, that's good too. <laughs> okay, so, um, so why don't we start with Bob Burgess? I'm going to walk out of the room, but it's not personal. I'm going to be. I'm ready. sure it is personal, but I'll, I'll <laughs> no. go on about it. Okay. <laughs> so I got all these things, especially for you. They love poems. If you okay. leave it. So stall for a minute. I'll go back. <laughs> Please, somebody help me stall, because this will be fun. Richard, you got some heckling? Yes. Let's have it. Tell us what you had for breakfast <laughs> in a poetic sense. We'll do this. Yeah. I, I was more interested in the love poems. Come on. You don't, you don't like Richard's Hecklin? <laughs> oh, she, damn it, you're back. We were just going to talk about a very obscene breakfast. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I had more than two eggs. And then she made me a special kind of bacon I haven't had in years. It reminded me of when I was young. <laughs> you want to fill in, sweetie? Old oh my God, he's recording this. <laughs> <laughs> Getting better all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, the stuff I have in store, maybe we'd better continue with the breakfast. Should I get on with it, Peter? Please. <laughs> <laughs> the voice of authority be killing me. Ow. 
So I think it's time. Jeez, this is false accent. So I think it's time for a change from the usual gloom and doom, don't you think, Danny? Yeah. <laughs> Why, suddenly he be speaking up from the back, does he? So I think it'd be time for a change, Josh, from the usual gloom and doom. What you say? Yay. Spring be finally in the air. So we want to read... Why, I, this is actually scripted, just so I wouldn't go off and curse. <laughs> so I want to read you some sweet little love poems about love and life. One famous beauty we all know by Mary. One by E.E. E. Cummings, and those of you who know, know which one that's gonna be. And another little tidbit by Willie. <laughs> you got something with Willie, Richie? Yosh is dying already behind us. Shut up, Bob, and get on with the crap already, will ya? And I finish up with one of me own, which of course you may have heard before and you're gonna have to hear it again. <laughs> Booing is welcome at appropriate places. Even from those of you who really want to do it. <laughs> Hi, Caroline, sweetie. Oh, it's getting dangerous now, isn't yeah. it? Better get on with the script. This what is was not... in that water? Pardon? What was in your glass of water? I don't need anything, sweetie. Don't you know that? <laughs> yeah. That's why they threw me out of equity, you know, because I started doing improv on a script. Okay. So, given this intro, and if, if we're starting with one of all the many nice ones that she's written. Don't you think we just got to hear the wild one again? You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert, repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me, tell me about despair yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. So, whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese harsh and exciting, over and over, announcing your place in the family of things. So let's switch gears a little with a little tongue-in-cheek beauty by old Willie Shakespeare. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, 
Why then her breasts are done, if hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damasked, red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks, and in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. Yet I love to hear her speak. Yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I grant, though I never saw a goddess go, my mistress, when she walks, treads heavily on the ground. Yet by heaven I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare. And this then, of course, by E.E. E. Cummings, the real thing, somewhere I have never traveled, gladly beyond any experience your eyes have their silence. In your most frail gesture are things which enclose me or which I cannot touch because they are too near. Your slightest look easily will unclose me Though I have closed myself, as fingers you open always, petal by petal, myself as spring opens, touching skillfully, mysteriously, her first rose. Or if your wish be to close me, I and my life will shut very beautifully, suddenly, as when the heart of this flower imagines the snow carefully everywhere descending. Nothing, nothing, which we are to perceive in this world equals the power of your intense fragility, whose texture compels me with the color of its countries, rendering death and forever with each breathing. I do not know what it is about you that closes and opens. Only something in me understands. The voice of your eyes is deeper than all roses. Nobody, not even the rain, has such small hands. And so, let's end this little interlude, Macy, with an old love song about a boy from New York City. Da -da 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 Written when I was quite a wee bit younger, and life seemed a bit longer, lighter, 
simpler. Once upon a time, long, long ago, I'll never forget how you came up to me with your strong bones and wind-stained eyes that once in a never morning out of nowhere it seemed from some undiscovered country and told me in no uncertain tones at all how it was that you and I were only a child years old as I rolled the wet dirt and squeezed you through me fingers and really did smell all those flowers you asked me to. Me coming to here to this greenhouse after all the cities of me youth and listening to, to you instruct me about the ways of the earth telling me with trees and leaves in your eyes about, of all things, the country. As if you owned all of it locked up right there in your pastoral bosom, telling me how it really was better than my neon background, and, and me believing you and wishing I'd grown up somewhere else than those steaming New York streets. That I, too, like you, could ride horses and learn to love things green, even if they did have all those damn bumps in them, and jump around farms and barns for the rest of my time, hoping with all of whatever was left of my armored heart that you would never stop dancing in our garden of childhood and not be afraid of my loud traffic ways since I already breathed in your air, sleep in your stars and dare my steel motors to challenge me here where I climb through your clouds and your trees and your country smile. Hope springs eternal. Thanks for listening. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. That sonnet by Shakespeare is one of my favorites. I love the, that sonnet. Oh, is this? Yeah. It's fabulous. So understated. It's wonderful. Alrighty, um, Anne Schaffmaster, would you like to go next? Sure. Alrighty, Anne Schaffmaster. And just to let uh, everyone know and the audience, <laughs> there is wine and cheese. So. Please help yourself. So actually, I was going <laughs> to mention that just before the intermission, but it's but it's good here too. So. Yash has brought some lovely things back there. And up here, there was a um, 100th anniversary of women's suffrage event happening in front of the library. And they had extra cookies and lemonade and cake. So we have that up here, too. And Are we only for women, though, right? No. As long as you're not against women voting, you're fine. So. How about, really? How about, <laughs> how about if all we know is that we love women? Folks, you know all this is being recorded. It really <laughs> doesn't matter what your beliefs are. You can have cookies and cake. It's fine. <laughs> well said. The cheese is really good, by the way. Oh, good. Yeah, I'm going to keep bringing that. That's really nice cheese. <laughs> um, I'm reading one poem, uh, but it's actually four pages, and um, I have three sections, and each section has a title. Um, the original um, working kind of title for this poem was The Fate of Normalcy, but then I got a little more realistic, and I named it um, Asylum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so the first section, section one, so this three sections, is called consultation. I speak in the tongue of the depressed. The glass in the wood frame cracks and the pit of the peach falls to the floor. Tick tock, the bedroom clock. There is no sleep at night until light seeps under the bedroom door. And yet this interrupted sleep is not anything about which I care to speak. You are nothing but other. You are no one but other. Still you hold my egg-shaped head between your top draw hands as if the yolk of my being is the essential ingredient for your purpose in life. But what you excel at here is putting frontal lobes into a blender of electroshock therapy and locking up people for weeks or years. You tell me I'm depressed, citing suicidal statistics, and as your mouth opens and shuts, my heart hurts because you do not know me and I am reduced to three pages of questions and answers about my family history. Yet I watch you hover close to the edge of maybe being present to me. But it is the textbook of academia that tells you I don't have a prayer because off a rafter my mother's father swung and Uncle James thought he was a bird and flew five stories down. Grandma liked gas best. Aunt Blanche drowned. Aunt Ruth lit a match and fried herself brown. So here she is. It's her turn now. So that one's consultation. Um, and the next one is called session one. <laughs> the room is hot. It's early spring and the steam radiator bangs on and off. You say I'm depressed, but I get the feeling you want me to be someone else. Who would that be? Your fake concern is a distance between us. CBT and DBT today. I would much prefer Thanksgiving or Christmas. Your mouth opens and shuts. My preference is shut. Thank you, please. Sitting in group for an hour will not fix anything. The be like others scares me. The others are clingy in a disproportionate way. Take my roommate, your one o'clock, the one who tried to suffocate herself by sticking her head in a garbage bag but forgot to swallow her pills first. The world tells her secrets. She says my eyes stay open when I sleep. I don't think I can change. I think things when I shouldn't be thinking them. How I see you is not how I see myself. Um, and then the third one uh, in The Fate of Normalcy um, is called Belly Up. It's easy to distinguish those of us who are well from those who are not. I look around at my fellow depressives some of whom hang their heads between their knees, and I wonder, who of us will survive this? I wonder if I'm here because I have had infantile responses toward the normal demands of life. The walls of the waiting room are painted a pale shade of vomit, and there is little ventilation because electroshock therapy is in a windowless basement, and in this cramped room, in this windowless basement, our metal chairs are placed so close to each other that I can see a pimple on the chin of the young girl who sits directly across from me. I try not to stare, but staring is habit forming. The nurses appear hopeful. If someone acts up because maybe they are on the wrong meds, or maybe they are afraid of how hard it is to feel this bad from the minute you first wake up. I wonder what I can do to comfort them. No one else here seems to notice anything. I might feel better if someone said, look at her. 
But the truth is that the nurse's hopefulness is bland and false, and the smell of Lysol so much worse than the smell of dirty socks. There's not a single piece of art, just a dog-eared poster listing the characteristics of an addict and an artificial palm tree leaning backward against the wall. When the door to treatment opens, a ghost appears. He looks damaged, and nothing about him is reassuring. This is the moment when everything changes, and I imagine the magic of shamans. I pretend that I am who I used to be. There are words, of course, but my tongue cannot find them. I forget how to form the syllable for joy, and I wonder why the earth and the sea have abandoned me. Thank God you're here. <laughs> that was wonderful. Um, Corey Cook, would you like to go next? So I've already changed what I'm going to read after hearing Anne's poem. <clears throat> I haven't. I've never read this one before. Um, hopefully, I can do it. Um, my uncle committed suicide, and this poem is about that. The night my uncle shot himself. The, the meteorologist had remarked on the clear skies during the five o'clock news, a stargazing kind of night. And I couldn't help but see the constellation above my uncle's head as I drove to his house after mom's frantic call. Blood spatter against an unfinished pine headboard, each spot rounded and still reflecting light. All right. Um, so I, I think it was a couple weeks ago now, um, I went to the Donald Hall estate sale, which I felt sort of conflicted about. Um, for one, I, you know, I had read so much of his work and so much of Jane's work, I wasn't sure if I wanted my picture to, to be disturbed. Um, but it also in another way it sort of felt, I wasn't sure how I felt about all those people being in their house. You know, they were private people. They spent a lot of quiet out hours there working. Um, but like on the other hand, it, it sort of felt appropriate giving, giving back to, you know, the town, the community, the state, because I think people felt um, really connected to them. But anyway, I, I ended up going. Um, so this, this first poem um, was inspired by that, um, and it's still sort of a work in progress, but I wanted to share it. At the Donald Hall and Jane Kenyon estate sale, others were there for the antiques, baseball memorabilia. I returned again and again to their books. Fingers stuttering over stiff spines. Found three inscribed by Jane, her signature drawn out and fluid in the first two, deliberate and jagged in the third, as if brought to her as she sat in bed, propped up by pillows, glasses in place, pen loose in her hand on one of those last days. And then one more. Um, at the Donald Hall reading in Woodstock, Vermont. He sits and reads on the stage, lucid and witty. Oh, actually, I've got to stop it there. I did want to point out that the last 
uh, four or five words of this poem I stole from one of his poems. Um, uh, it's from his poem, The Afterlife. I can remember reading it and it's sort of buried in the middle of the poem and I can remember thinking, I mean, it's a great line, but like that's really, you know, should be the last line. <laughs> 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 or I should just say, it is a great last line, so. All right, at the Donald Hall reading in Woodstock, Vermont. He sits, on the, sits and reads on the stage, lucid and witty, walker idle beside him, hair disheveled, sunken neck obscured by gray beard. He reads a poem about Jane, his wife who had it out with leukemia and lost. Donald clears his throat, another poem about their dog Gus, and the couple sitting in front of me face each other, mouths downturned, eyes watery and reflective, clutching each other's hands, a green onyx ring on her index finger, more hazel than green, like your eyes, those wide and welcoming orbs, framed by thick brown hair, each one anchored by a scattering of faint freckles, the only constellations I have mapped with my fingertips. I know that you and I would have looked at each other in the same way. Donald clears his throat, and I, and I am and I am alone again with your absence. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you for changing things up a little and adding that other poem in there. Um, okay, let's see. Peter, would you like to go next? Sure. Peter Fox Smith. I had the pleasure recently, recently being this spring, of being invited by Ina Anderson to read with her. And she opened by saying, after reading the first poem, I have started with a bleak poem, which kind of gave me an indication for writing some bleak poems. So I'm going to share with you some bleak poems that I've been working on for the past few weeks. Sorry to change the mood from your lovely springtime love fest. You knew mine were bleak anyway. <laughs> Old Man on the Terrace. After long weeks of gray days, cold with rain, today under a blue cloudless sky, I sit on our terrace with my back to the sun, much slathered with white greasy lotion to prevent evil ultraviolet rays from turning my pallid skin into knobs of keratosis, or worse, squamous carcinomas, which must be evicted with knives. So sitting on the terrace, airing arid winter out of my dry bones, I write, pause, Peer upon far distant hills, or our burgeoning little lilac bushes, or birch and maple budding into leaf, and though with many old age ills, I'm content. The grass is green again, it always is, after six months of snow melts away, and brooks replete Sing Spring's song, dashing downhill riverward. Home again, songbirds from tall trees carol melodies while I heed a tiny puff of white cloud changing a hundred times. Nebulous shapes floating on sea of blue. 
Is there meaning to this? Meaning beyond my isolated muse, speculations of renaissance, or only fleeting thoughts of fixed mortality. There's no meaning. There is no plan. Just cycles born of chance with men and women and all between, so stubborn and sure to make it mean. By the way, all of these have similar themes and images running through them. Second one is rain. The storm predicted has not dismounted as yet, but heavy hang clouds overhead and stationary lilacs beckoning for a drink start to dance as breezes blow, though not till mid of night did rain commence to fall as ghostly fears of dead god jeers thrust sapien ears, the gods which we have made, the gods which we have slain, all uncleansed by rain. Next one is my expression of a major concern that I have had for many years, and that is going back to Malthus and the geometric increase of people upon this one small earth. This poem is entitled, The Way It Is. It's not that there's no good in life. There is for this person or that some happiness once in a while, but the species spins downward abundantly without control, crashing upon human progress, bursting into smithereens, dead morsels in slow decay. Oh, it is not so, say they who know only goodness in the nature of things. They who do not see sad, hungry eyes sunk in agony, do not see that among riches, vast multitudes of empty cup beggars squat in urine-stained rags their bony knees stuck in space move not throughout hours. This is the way of a wicked, wicked world, of far too many mobs of humankind, people fucking themselves into a massive throng of definite extirpation. It's called being peopled to death. <laughs> in the evening, in the evening, many, many moods we partake no more. A crystal glass of glowing wine with each night's repast nor is it graced by unblessed bread of a raw hunger. All remembrance washed away, the monsoon rain and wind blowing obliquely as frail trembling thoughts tumble out of revelations, frenzied hopes into fomenting fragments. He was Christus, 
they claimed, in a story opined multitudinous times, as years sink into centuries of Sunday jests, in round the world demise, where famished birds savage such remains. I'm assuming that we're all aware of the Big Bang and that the atoms of which we are composed are the same atoms that were isolated and identified as the Big Bang. And so this poem entitled Stardust to Ashes has under it a brief quotation by the famous astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. And he wrote, I feel big because my atoms come from the stars. Poem in two parts, one. An acrid gale blows fierce while poisoned waters flood. The damaged earth laments as toxic fires consume vindictive, freaky Allah, old, tired, jealous Yahweh, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and the dry bones of those who bent in prayer, those who did not Indeed, an all-earth imperium of dancing, fickle flames, as moon man, much aghast, with tearing eyes, open mouth, and sobbing, shrinking shine, disperses into dark. Two, it is unlikely that Abiogenesis will emerge again from our sullied foul waters, a single cell to the walking, talking we of stardust made, but ashes now as fire storms expire on this stony, stark sphere, wind whipping clouds of dross wherever while to the sea mindless rivers roll, and in the blue or black skies a spectral silence drums its funereal march into the vast beyond. And because that's all so bleak, and because I so intensely fight against certain words that catch on and are used by everybody all the time, here's six lines of a more joyful mood, I hope. It's called POW. Off they go this night, leaving behind cares and tears, to dance, laugh, and sing of iconic this, iconic that, and the next to utter iconic, I intend to pow, knock flat. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Thank you for listening. And I do like that even in your bleak poems, the lilacs dance. Oh. You know, it's, it's nice. Um, OK, so I found my glasses. So the, the poems I was going to read, um, it's interesting. Before, Bob told me that he wasn't going to do his normal bleak stuff. He was going to do happier stuff. And my stuff is a bit more bleak than what I usually do. So I figured it was a nice balance. But it kind of is like turned into a good first half, so I think I'll do it now rather than in the second half. It seems to be all of a piece. Um, and then we'll have an intermission and we can have, you know, wine and cheese and cake and cookies and lemonade and then we can have a whole different second half. Or not. Who knows. Um, 
So I have this little book by Christina Rossetti that I was looking through, Goblin Market and other poems. I'm not going to read Goblin Market, but um, it's, you know, life is interesting and um, it's, it's kind of ironic and beautiful, wonderful spring with all the flowering trees and stuff to be in a bleak mood. Um, it happens and I, yeah, so, and Christina's in the club, so <laughs> I don't know that she wrote them in June, but um, anyway, here's a few poems. A better resurrection. I have no wit, no words, no tears. My heart within me like a stone is numbed too much for hopes and or fears. Look right, look left, I dwell alone. I lift mine eyes, but dimmed with grief, no everlasting hills I see. My life is in the falling leaf. O oh, Jesus, quicken me. My life is like a faded leaf. My harvest dwindled to a husk. Truly my life is void and brief and tedious in the barren dusk. My life is like a frozen thing. No bud nor greenness can I see. Yet rise it shall, the sap of spring, O oh Jesus, rise in me. My life is like a broken bowl, a broken bowl that cannot hold one drop of water for my soul or cordial in the searching cold. Cast in the fire the perished thing, melt and remold it, till it be a royal cup for him, my king, O oh Jesus, drink from me. And this is called, What Would I Give? What would I give for a heart of flesh to warm me through, instead of this heart of stone, ice cold, whatever I do? Hard and cold and small, of all hearts, the worst of all. What would I give for words, if only words would come? But now in its misery, my spirit has fallen dumb. Oh, merry friends, go your way. I have never a word to say. What would I give for tears, not smiles, but scalding tears to wash the black mark clean and to thaw the frost of years, to wash the stain in grain and to make me clean again? Whoa. I never heard that one before. That is. I hadn't either. Yeah, it's quite a poem. It certainly is. Okay, and this one is called The First Spring Day. Um, this is part of the irony of like outside it's spring, but it doesn't feel like spring inside yet. The First Spring Day. I wonder if the sap is stirring yet. If wintry birds are dreaming of a mate. If frozen snowdrops feel as yet the sun and crocus fires are kindling one by one. Sing, Robin, sing. I still am sore in doubt concerning spring. I wonder if the springtide of this year will bring another spring both lost and dear, if heart and spirit will find out their spring, or if the world alone will bud and sing. Sing, hope, to me. Sweet notes, my hope, soft notes for memory. The sap will surely quicken soon or late. The tardiest bird will twitter to a mate. So spring must dawn again with warmth and bloom. Or in this world, or in the world to come, sing, voice of spring, till I too blossom and rejoice and sing. OK, now it's time for cookies. <laughs> Um, you can watch it on WCTV8, yeah. then you'll know what I said. <laughs> um, welcome back, everybody. This is such a fun group. I love this. Um, we do now have the book here, and it's open to the page for June 4th, 2019. And so we'd love it if everybody signs and puts whatever they want to put in there, your whatever. And we have three more poets tonight, and I'm thinking we're going to go Richard, then Jennifer, then Yash. Um, for the rest of the evening. Um, let's see, is there anything? Oh, I know one other thing I should say. So we have new fun equipment in this room. We have this, um, <laughs> isn't 
this cool. It comes. Next time we can have pictures for that poem. Visual. Well, or you could have a background, and we have. It, it does come all the way down, but we don't need to watch that. We sort of got the idea, right? Um, and we have speakers and connected to things. And so um, if you ever want to have like, a multimedia presentation with your poetry or anything like that, I don't yet know what exactly that means, but, you know, think about it. I mean, as far as, like, how people would utilize that. But it would be fun because it's new, and we are filmed every month if we kind of did some fun experimental things and then people could say oh look at that that worked really well or that, that didn't work so well I would do that differently but you know <laughs> it's kind of yes we have a projector you can hook up your laptop yeah. to the projector works really easy um, yeah so you know go to town come up with some stuff and we'll do it and it'll be fun and we'll see what happens um, okay Richard you're up Richard Esty and see how we're doing on time. Oh, we're fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've been working on memorizing uh, and for the past month working on um, one of Allen Ginsberg's poems because yesterday was his 97th birthday or something like that. He's been dead a while though. Uh, he was born 1926, June 3rd. One of his uh, quite often anthologized poems, uh, not, I don't know whether it's you know, considered one of the best poems or not, is Supermarket in California. And the reason I'm reciting it is because, of course, it's about Walt Whitman. And last month was, I read two poems about Walt Whitman, and so his continuing memory of Walt Whitman. I brought the cheat sheet just in case. I've been saying in the shower, yeah. so uh, <laughs> if turn, someone turn on the water, maybe it will help me. <laughs> okay. What thoughts I have of you tonight, Walt Whitman, for I walk down the streets, side streets, under the trees, with a headache, self-conscious, looking at the full moon. In my hungry fatigue and shopping for images, I went into the neon fruit supermarket, dreaming of your enumerations. What peaches and what penumbras? Whole families shopping at night, aisles full of husbands, wives in the avocados, babies in the tomatoes. And you, Garcia Lorca, what were you doing down by the watermelons? I saw you, Walt Whitman, childless, lonely old grubber, poking among the meats in the refrigerator and eyeing the grocery boys. I heard you asking questions of each. Who killed the pork chops? What price bananas? Are you my angel? I wandered in and out of the brilliant stacks of cans following you and followed in my imagination by the store detective. We strode down the open corridors together in our solitary fancy, tasting artichokes, possessing every frozen delicacy and never passing the cashier. Where are we going, Walt Whitman? The doors close in an hour. Which way does your beard point tonight? I touch your book and dream of our odyssey in the supermarket and feel absurd. Will we walk all night through solitary streets? The trees add shade to shade, lights out in the houses. We'll, we'll both be lonely. Will we stroll, dreaming of the lost America of love, past blue automobiles and driveways, toward our silent cottage? Ah, dear Father, 
gray beard, lonely old courage teacher. What America did you have when Karen quit pulling his ferry and you got out on a smoking bank and watched the boat disappear on the black waters of Lethe? Thank you. And now continuing the theme of Allen Ginsberg. Um, everyone's always looking around for older copies of Poetry Magazine. And the library had a rather nice collection of which I bought six or eight the other, sometime in the last few weeks. And I can't remember, I didn't buy this one at the library, but maybe in the used bookshop in Brattleboro. And you know, the unique thing about the used bookshop in Brattleboro is poetry is in the front of the store. Now almost all, <laughs> the guy said, I said, you have poetry in the front. He said, yeah, people come in and hunt around them. They immediately go to the back if they're looking for poetry. He said, then they'll say, oh, you don't have a poetry section. He says, oh no, it's in the front. <laughs> really? It's the only store we know with poetry in the front. And so I, I, he had some of these, so I'm about this one. So usually, you know, they're like a dollar usually at the most. And you'll find a few, one or two really good poems that are worth the dollar. In this one, this is September 2006, and there was an article in it <clears throat> uh, assessing the impact of Ginsburg's most well-known poem, Howell, 50 years later. And so what I did was I read the article uh, and then I underlined certain words that I thought I could come up with to put into a poem. And I thought, isn't that clever to do that? Of course, then a couple of weeks later, I read a poem where a guy goes to the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, and he, he you know, has the brochure going around to the display uh, of the, uh, explaining all the pieces. And um, then he takes that home and writes a poem using the words from the, um, from the brochure. So this one is called Pining for Howell. And most, you'll see the words, you'll see the sort of like Ginsburg-ish words. Writing his colorful world is sweetly syntactical. His lofty obsessions are mentally mystical. He's trying hard not to be verbally reckless Though his tedious incantations are aimless, he strides forth with dramatic stanzas of gibberish. His manic word combinations are feverish. His rhythmic transgressive flights of imagination yearn for ecstatic visions full of tragic agitation. He was inspired to write something historical, yet this daunting, haunting lament seems to turn hysterical. His energy and anxiety capture in alienation and reiterate his cherished disguise of aspiration. Metaphor and vision telescope jaded pilgrim formation. His haunting cosmos is suffused with misappropriation. Paranoid poetic juices pour from his erotic brain. His mantras and musings are America's exotic gain. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so Jennifer, would you like to go next? Jennifer Grant. So this is a poem that I wrote um, in the, the um, lead up to the Iraq War um, back in 2003. And it's a poem about freedom of speech. And it seemed like a good time to pull it out again. Mm -hmm. um, the Descendant by Jennifer Grant, copyright 2003. This is my country land that I love. My forebears came to on its soil their life improve. To build a land 
where all lived free and each pursued his destiny. That their descendants might yet find a place to thrive and speak their minds. That I might now assert my will, express my thought, learn my fill. That none should hear, give me the runoff, burn my home, lop my tongue off. But yet I find the same they fled, wagging fingers, nodding heads. Not all respect another's view, a different choice or attitude. To those who say, love it or leave it, all you hear, do you believe it? To think you're right and I am wrong, do you thus say, I don't belong? It's then our ample melting pot becomes too bland and yet too hot. Ask yourself what freedom means, to think the same on everything. If you and I are truly free, then surely we can disagree. We can differ, we can shout, yet neither turn the other out. I'll not depart, I'll not make haste, none seasick voyage shall I waste. I'll here remain and here grow old. This is my country to have and hold. Thank you. 16 years later, still is a very good poem. All right, so Yash Dembinski will round out the evening. This has been quite an evening, everybody. I've just been uh, overwhelmed and enjoyed. Uh, well, I, I, it's not so much a question of enjoyment as of listening, and I'm very grateful that I can listen and, and hear your words and, and become part of you in a way. So uh, my, my profound appreciation. And um, Peter, I read a, uh, I, I said earlier to you in the evening that you're, I think, sharing new poems is one of the bravest things you can do. And uh, so I salute your bravery, uh, no matter how bleak it is. And, and just, it, it, it brought to mind that I wrote a poem today that I, 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 I'm not gonna share, but it was, the title was, You Are of the Nature of Light. And, um, and then uh, Jennifer, just, Thank you for your poem as well, because I, I, I had to write two, I, I was thinking of like, I put the, together this collection of poetry of like my whole friggin' life, but it's, you know, I've had to pick and choose, because there's a lot I'm not gonna include. And I thought, whoa, this one is just too harsh. People aren't gonna have any idea where it's coming from, because the devotion is so feminine and so absolute. And it's like, well, I gotta lead up to that. <laughs> I just can't pop that on somebody in the second page of a book of poetry. So um, one of the poems I did write was called Be Free and on the Nature of Freedom. And um, all right, enough introductory comments. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I'm still uh, um, finding in Rilke my muse or not my muse, my guru, I would say. And of course, I, I came upon this poem and <laughs> I had to share it, I have to share it. And it goes like this. I think it's the 14th sonnet of Sonnet Storpheus. <clears throat> Spring has come again. The earth is like a child who knows poems by heart. Many, oh, many. For the vexation of long learning, she gets the prize. Her teacher was strict. We liked the white in the old man's beard. And now we may ask, what is the green, the blue called? And she knows it, she knows. 
Earth having holiday, lucky Earth. Play now with the children. We want to catch you, happy Earth. The happiest will succeed. Oh, what her teacher taught her, the many things, and what stands printed in roots and long, difficult stems. She sings it. She sings. How about that? <laughs> Rilke's wild, uh, I, I feel. Okay, so that, of course, brought me to uh, my deep roots and what stands printed in long, difficult stems, the Old Testament, and my uh, Old Testament sojourn. So I'm going to read, read a little bit to you of uh, chapter 9, and you can thank Danielle for uh, limiting how much you're going to get of it. <laughs> It won't be the full chapter. You'll have, to, you'll have to somehow read the book whenever it's done. Here we go, chapter 9. Uh, what's so exciting about this is, is really, if there's anything on an existential plane, I look at this as the just that somehow that miraculous photosynthesis that takes a seed and begins to create a green leaf. Because Moses here is going to the elders and he's meeting them for the first time. Well, how the heck is he going to convince them, I have the word of God, right? And we're going to be free from Pharaoh, right? Oh, yeah, right. It's like, we're going to be free from Trump. What? Anyway, we can be. And of course, this is what poetry is about and um, what this poem is about. Moses was led to a deep cave beneath a plateau near to the Nile by Aaron. It was where the elders and priests kept faith with the Lord and the site where they passed on. From generation to generation, ritual stories of their ancestors. Before the cave's entrance, strong emotion gripped Moses' heart. He would meet the elders whom he had loved for so long from afar suffering that he was not suffering as they were. Who was he? Not their savior. It's all right. All right, anyway. Who was he? Not their savior. Never as they had he been enduring. And yet he brought God's word and its power from the Lord who was ever the savior. Moses looked lost. He was having a nervous breakdown, right? He didn't, he was lost. Who am I? I'm not their savior. Anyway, I'm having a nervous breakdown right now. No, I'm not, I'm just ad living. <laughs> Moses looked lost. Aaron spoke. Now's the hour for you to speak, to say the words of our God. You cannot be frightened. I will speak if need be. Aaron was Moses' older brother, if you didn't know. Moses felt cross sensations. Could he tell Aaron how completely weak he felt? In spirit, he felt a summons to the burning bush and the Lord's presence. Became aware his hope to be a friend to these elders was vain. The only sense for his being there was to bring an end to the dire enslavement pharaohs had wrought. He nodded to Aaron. They walked forward into the cave's inner chamber and sought where to stand among so many gathered to hear and see Moses, men summoned there by Aaron and the priests. Amid the light of many candles, all the faces were turned toward two men who entered. The sight of Moses, old yet tall and strong, stirred hope in every heart. He seemed a natural leader but just a man. How could he cope with the great Pharaoh and their leaders all in the past had acquiesced to broader and more severe laws and edicts? Few of the men had ever seen Moses, brother of Aaron. Some strained to have clear sight of him, who, the priests said, could bring improvement to the lives of the tribes. 
of all the tribes. Those there were eager to hear from Moses, though some meant to safeguard their hard-earned status. They were pharaohed by favor as overseers. A small man stepped forward. Welcome, Aaron. Welcome, Moses. Pharaoh has many years, so be circumspect with your words. No one can be sure who is in his pay. But come, tell us why you have called us here, here where we safeguard the holy faith. We welcome you with joy, but please know many are here at risk to themselves and their families. So spoke Korah, son of Ishar, brother to Amram, a cousin with many ties to the brothers. Moses, you whose mother was none other than glorious Pharaoh herself, speak. Tell us here what you will speak to our Pharaoh, Amenatop. But so astounded was Moses by the words, sleek and dark, that seemed to welcome, yet deceived. He could not speak. He stared intently at his cousin. Korah flinched as if aggrieved. <clears throat> then Aaron, what do you say? I hope that you at least have something to tell us. Yes, Aaron stepped forward. But are you prepared to hear? Hear how our God intends to bless us? No response came. So are you prepared? As one, those gathered had become silent and a slight smile played upon Korah's face. I went not in search of a ghost. I went with the word of God in my mind, a place by a mountain. I found Moses and he, Aaron turned and looked at Moses. Stairway. Turned at Moses, uh, turned and uh, looked at Moses, who shook his head, urging him to speak on. And he has the word himself from our God who took our ancestors from the land of Canaan according to his word, and brought us here, according to his word, where, to a man, we have been enslaved. And yet, yet I fear we cannot hear what he will now do for us according to his word. And each man present knew of the promise. Each was sure deliverance had to come but what plan did their God have? And what could Moses do? The priest, Peter, would you come forward and just read these lines? And what could Moses do? The priest who had been aggrieved rose and spoke. Aaron and Moses, we are ready. You have the word of God, the Lord. I awoke this morning with a premonition, one like the sweetest dawn, and with the pure taste of honey on my lips. The priest's eyes shone with a fierce, humble joy. Let us not waste the little time we have here together. We have come to hear the word of our Lord. Then Aaron, thank you. Then Aaron recounted all his brother had told him, and none present, none that heard with open ears and heart could disbelieve while Aaron spoke. But, but how strange the name their God had revealed for them to believe. How strange, yet perfect. A large candle's flame flickered out and Korah quietly asked, and this, Staff, you say? I'm ending there. <laughs> uh, but that does, you know, because I ended on a staff. Uh, and thank you. I'm so, yeah, no kidding. It's like I had to call you up. <laughs> thank you for, for doing that. Uh, I mean, you're free, of course, to keep as bleak a view of life as you want, but I just had to call you up. <laughs> With uh, my staff. With your staff, absolutely. So, and I think you'll appreciate this poem. I, I wrote it when I was in my 20s. And I was, of course, I had 
gotten past my uh, monastic intentions and had realized that, you know, it's, it's a good thing to be married. And uh, this, I wrote this poem a couple years before uh, I was married. When you're in that state of like <laughs> bouncing <laughs> between uh, loves and infatuations and whatnot, um, and I was staring. Oh, I meant to bring it, but I was staring at this little cobalt ashtray that had a. Uh, it was a Wentworth something supposedly valuable. I don't know what it was called, but anyway, it had a picture of a an angel with a horse. My father, one of his favorite lines was, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. So this is the poem. And everything I've said up to now will make sense with this poem. And you have heard it before, probably, some of you. The little shepherd heard, the, the little shepherd of peace heard the word when there were no stars in the heaven's night when he asked if there ever came the Lord. He cried, not knowing what could be adored. As he held with his staff, no flock in sight, he thought of the word sense with which he might walk along happily with death ignored, creating a path with his footsteps light. Empty yourself of all hope but my love was wisdom that became his thoughts first guide. Often he quenched his thirst in pools not above his heart, where murmured, more often, a dove. In the end of his days, he could not hide from the man with his word staff by his side. Thank you, everyone. Alrighty, so ends another gathering of recite. Um, come back next month, and if you have like some techie stuff to do, we'll do it. Um, sign the book, eat cookies, cheese, stuff. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.